Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com. This is Antiwar News for Friday, 1st, 2023. All right, the first story at the top of Antiwar.com today. Ukraine begins firing U.S. cluster bombs. So Ukrainian officials told the Washington Post on Thursday that Ukrainian forces have started firing U.S.-provided cluster munitions at Russian soldiers in southeastern Ukraine, and this was later confirmed by the White House. So last year, the White House called the use of cluster bombs in Ukraine a potential war crime, but President Biden signed off on the delivery of the civilian killing munitions earlier this month. As I've covered it quite a bit, cluster bombs are so hazardous to civilians because they spread small submunitions over large areas, and the submunitions that don't explode immediately on impact can kill or maim, maim civilians for decades to come. We're still seeing that in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. In some, some of those countries, they say it'll take 100 years to clean them all up. So according to the Washington Post, by sending the bombs to Ukraine, President Biden bypassed U.S. law that prohibits the production, use, or transfer of cluster munitions with a dud rate of more than 1%. The dud rate refers to the percentage of these submunitions, or bomblets as they call them, that don't explode. So the Pentagon is claiming that the munitions they are sending to Ukraine have a dud rate of 2.35%, which is higher than 1%. Uh, however, that's probably not true. The New York Times reported that the rate will likely be 14%. It could even be higher. Basically, what they're saying is that the Pentagon tests don't take into account, don't take into account the conditions on the battlefield. You know, if the ground is soft, uh, they're less likely to explode, things like that, factors like that. And the U.S. has given Ukraine what are known as dual-purpose improved conventional munitions in the form of 155 millimeter artillery shells and they are packed with 72 of these small submunitions. So the Washington Post report said that that President Biden bypassed the law by using a rare provision of the Foreign Assistance Act that allows the U.S. to provide weapons regardless of export controls if the president determines doing so is a vital national security interest. So, I mean, that's just really ridiculous because, of course, fueling a proxy war against Russia, the world's largest nuclear armed state, is a huge risk to U.S. national security. And who controls, you know, the Donbass or Zaporozhia, uh, you know, does not matter to U.S. national security when, especially when you're talking about risking war with Russia, risking nuclear war. It's just completely absurd. But it doesn't matter. The law doesn't matter. The president does what he wants. Uh, Biden administration officials have defended the decision to send cluster bombs by saying that the U.S. and Ukraine are running out of other types of ammunition. And they have also pointed to Russia's use of cluster bombs in the conflict. So according to Human Rights Watch, which has made the you know cluster bomb accusations, they're saying that there are hundreds of documented or alleged uses of cluster bombs by both sides in the conflict. Hundreds. But the U.S. provision of cluster bombs will make the use of the weapon much more widespread, as the Pentagon said that it will provide hundreds of thousands of shells. A Ukrainian official told the Washington Post that they are firing cluster munitions at Russian troop positions in an attempt to break up Russia's trenches. And U.S. officials have been saying, you know, this isn't going to help them break through. It's basically just going to help them keep fighting. As Blinken put it, they would be defenseless without these cluster bombs. So Russia is claiming that they haven't used cluster bombs in the war in Ukraine, but they're saying that they will respond in kind. They're saying if the Ukrainians start using them, then they'll start using them against Ukrainian forces. So it's just going to increase the use of cluster bombs. And, you know, it's just really going to doom a lot of Ukrainian civilians for so long because the U.S. has made this decision. And the argument is, well, cluster bombs have already been used. Russia's laying huge minefields, so they're going to have to clean up all these ordinances anyway. So why not just, you know, put more on top of that? I think it's just completely ridiculous uh, reasoning. But they're being used. They're on the battlefield. The U.S. is a party to 
something that they called a war crime a year ago. All right, the next one here, the UK's MI6 spy chief urges Russians to spy. So the head of Britain's MI6 spy agency has called for Russians opposed to the war in Ukraine to collaborate with the intelligence service. So this is Richard Moore. He's the head of MI6. He told Politico on Wednesday, quote, I invite them to do what others have done this past 18 months and join hands with us. Our doors always open. Their secrets will be safe with us, and together we will work to bring the bloodshed to an end, end quote. So you notice what he said there, do what others have done this past 18 months. So it sounds like he's saying that they've been recruiting Russians, you know, people inside Russia to spy for the UK. And the CIA has also been openly trying to recruit Russians by posting videos on social media in Russian with instructions on how to contact the agency via the dark web. So, you know, I went over this earlier this month that CIA director William Burns called the war in Ukraine a great opportunity for the spy agency, uh, you know, for recruiting, which is just quite the thing for the, you know him to say. I mean, if you, you could imagine Russian officials were just openly saying they're trying to recruit American spies and, you know, that would be a huge deal in the United States. There would be stories about that all over the place. And here you have. William Burns, uh, you know, the way he, he called it a once in a generation opportunity for the CIA, you know, really uh, just provocative things for these Western spy chiefs to be saying so openly and publicly. All right, the next one here, Congress sets up a battle over Taiwan military aid. So the House and the Senate are set up for a fight over how much military aid to include for Taiwan in 2024 spending bills as each chamber's appropriations committees granted a different amount. So the Senate Appropriations Committee on Thursday passed its 2024 State Department and Foreign Aid Spending Bill that includes $113 million in foreign military financing grants for Taiwan. The House Appropriations Committee's version of the bill includes $500 million in foreign military financing, FMF grants for Taiwan. So that's a few hundred million dollars more that the Republican-led House is trying to give Taiwan. And FMF is a State Department program that gives foreign governments money to buy U.S.-made arms. The 2023 National Defense Authorization Act included $2 billion in FMF for Taiwan, but congressional appropriators only approved the funds as loans that needed to be paid back. So this gets a little confusing. So the, the 2023 NDAA is the one that they passed and signed last year. And, you know, they put $2 billion for Taiwan in there. But then when it came to appropriations, which actually, you know, makes the funds available to fulfill the NDAA, the appropriators only put that in as loans, which is because they were worried about cutting the State Department budget in other areas. Um, and as far as I know, th those loans haven't been used. I haven't seen any announcements from the State Department that they were loaning Taiwan money to buy weapons. Uh, but this, you know, what they're trying to put in for next year is, you know, grants that they're going to give to Taiwan. So you have the Republican-led House. They're trying to give Taiwan more military aid than the Senate. But it's State Department spending bill. So this spending bill, it's called the State and Foreign Aid. You know, there's like an official name for it, but it's basically State Department funding and foreign aid. And the House version is $52.5 billion, which is lower than the Senate's version. The Senate's version is $61.8 billion. So they're going to need to negotiate what's going to be the final version. And it's unclear how much military aid Taiwan is going to end up getting. So I think there's going to be a lot of back and forth between the House and the Senate, just the nature of the fact that the Republicans are leading the House and the Democrats are leading the Senate. Um, so I think they're going to struggle to you know, get the final NDAA and you know, um, get these the final State Department funding and all that. But the U.S. is also looking to give Taiwan military aid through the Presidential Drawdown Authority, and that authorizes weapon shipments directly from military stockpiles directly from Pentagon stockpiles and this is the primary way the US has been arming Ukraine so the 2023 NDAA included 1 billion dollars in these funds for Taiwan the Pentagon said back in May that they were preparing a 500 million dollar presidential drawdown authority arms package for Taiwan but they have yet to send send those weapons and apparently the China hawks are hounding them about it you know when are you going to send these weapons to Taiwan 
And from China's perspective, U.S. military aid for Taiwan is extremely provocative. The U.S. has sold weapons to Taiwan since severing diplomatic relations with Taipei in 1979, but has not financed the purchases or provided arms free of charge. So it's a big deal. It's kind of a new level of support for Taiwan. When President Biden signed the 2023 NDAA into law that included military aid for Taiwan, China launched major military exercises around Taiwan in response. And there was no secret about that. The Chinese military came out and said that it was in response to that uh, NDAA. All right, the next one here, this is from Responsible Statecraft. The GOP to Biden officials, diplomacy and trade with China is a sign of weakness. And this is the attitude of the China hawks, uh, especially on the Republican side in Congress. So Republican members of the House Select Committee on the Chinese Communist Party used much of their time during a hearing Thursday to accuse Biden officials of weakness for their willingness to engage with China, both diplomatically and economically. The charges focused in part on the recent visits to China by prominent senior officials, which includes uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, and John Kerry was over there uh, as well. He's the climate envoy. I always forget he's in the Biden administration, but he's there. Um, So the members of the select committee grilled three officials from three key agencies on the administration's policy toward Beijing. The Pentagon's Eli Ratner, who's a huge China hawk, and they have to pretend that he's not. You know, they have to act like Biden's China policies aren't actually really hawkish. Um, the State Department's Daniel Crittenbrink and Thea Rosman Kendler from the Commerce Department, and they're basically just saying, you know, you're weak. Don't talk to China. And you know, the other thing that's odd, interesting here is that some of them, some of these Republicans, are calling for cutting off tr- all trade with China completely economic decoupling. Republican members argued that not only was diplomacy a sign of weakness, but so too is trade, with two calling for the end of all trade with China moving forward. So this is Representative Blaine Lutkemeyer, Republican from Missouri. He said, quote, we've got to stop everything going to China because a willingness to be a partner with them endangers us down the road, end quote. So, you know, I watched some of this hearing, just completely hysterical, just not serious people, you know, the way that they talk about this and that idea that we're going to cut off all trade with China. I mean, how much that would take. And it's just and if we do do that, then that makes war much more likely. And, you know, it's just complete. Uh, hysteria in DC over China. And it's not good when everybody's hysterical like that. That means, you know, it can lead to really bad things. All right, the next one here, the House kills effort to end emergency war powers. So this article is from Alexander Rubenstein over at the Gray Zone. And it says that in a massive show of support for limitless executive power, Congress rejected legislation that would have terminated national emergency powers, allowing Washington to wage war across the Middle East and to test biological weapons on U.S. citizens. That doesn't sound good. Uh, So this was led by Representative Paul Gosar. I believe he's a Republican from Arizona. A handful of Republican members of Congress launched a protest against 41 nominal national emergency declarations, many of which are decades old. So Rep. Gosar has argued that the National Emergencies Act is tyrannical, granting 148 separate powers to the executive branch. The July 18th, uh, on July 18th, which was Tuesday, the House voted down five resolutions to terminate national emergency powers, which date back as far as 2003. So they voted on these emergency powers that affect uh, Congo, Yemen, uh, Libya, Syria, and Iraq. Each vote saw a coalition of pro-war Democrats and Republicans join together in overwhelming numbers to protect the executive branch's emergency authorities. I believe only a few dozen Republicans voted to get rid of these emergency declarations. And these things allow the U.S. to sanction countries. These specific examples, there's one to sanction Syria that started in 2004, one to sanction the Democratic Republic of Congo. And there's also this emergency act on Libya, and it's on the basis that Muammar Gaddafi poses a threat to the U.S., and he's long dead, but they still renew these emergency powers, these emergency you know, resolutions, whatever they call them, 
you know, using Gaddafi as, as the reason. Um, and this kind of just leaves open the ability for the U.S. to take action against Libya and all these other countries. And, uh, you know, I wasn't, I'm happy that uh, Alex wrote these up because I was kind of, I saw this, I was trying to figure out exactly what these emergency powers mean. And it is kind of confusing. Um, and this didn't really get much attention. But the one thing here, so Eli Crane is saying, you know, I wasn't sure, again, exactly what these resolutions repealing these emergency powers would do. Um, besides the sanctions, it wouldn't, you know, it would lose, they would lose the ability to sanction some of these countries, which would be good. So Eli Crane is saying that his resolution to repeal the emergency for Iraq would result in a full withdrawal of U.S. troops from Iraq which, uh, you know, I, I thought they would have to repeal, you know, the AUMF for that because there's two AUMFs there's for Iraq. There, Well, there actually there's only one for Iraq for the Iraq invasion, but then there's the 2001 authorization for the use of military force that they use to stay in Iraq and Syria, and they use that in Somalia and across Africa and in Yemen. Um, but he's saying this, getting rid of this, we would have to w- withdraw. And there's also one for Yemen, um, so, you know, it's just good to see at least some people in Congress caring about these places and, and wanting to uh, get out and limit executive authority to wage war and to wage economic war, because that's what sanctions are. They're not some kind of peaceful alternative to war. They're economic war, and it, you know, hurts the country's most vulnerable. Um, that's just the nature of them. All right, the next one here, U.S. launches airstrike in Somalia, says five killed. So U.S. Africa Command on Thursday said that it launched an airstrike in Somalia in support of the Mogadishu-based government forces who were engaged with al-Shabaab on the ground. So AFRICOM said the strike was launched in a remote area about nine miles south of the village of Galkad in Somalia's central Galgudud region near the border of Middle Shabel of the Middle Shabel region. The area is about 150 miles northeast of Mogadishu. Um, so it's like lower central Somalia. So the AFRICOM claimed that its initial assessment found the strike killed five Al-Shabaab fighters and claimed that no civilians were harmed. We always have to keep in mind that the Pentagon is notorious for undercounting civilian casualties. AFRICOM did not say what day the strike was launched, but the Mogadishu-based government said that its ground forces, the Somali National Army, launched a joint military operation with the U.S. in the same area on Wednesday. The Somali Information Ministry claimed that 100 Al-Shabaab fighters were killed in the fighting. And it's not clear if there was U.S. troops on the ground involved in this. There's, as far as we know, 500 U.S. troops. Although when Congress was debating uh, Gates' resolution to withdraw from Somalia, they were saying there's 900 troops there. Um, So it's not clear if U.S. troops were involved on the ground or if it was just airstrikes. Um, But before this airstrike, the last known U.S. airstrike in Somalia was reported by AFRICOM on July 9th, and they said that 10 Al-Shabaab fighters were killed then in three separate strikes. Before that, AFRICOM reported a strike on June 2nd, but it looks like they're not reporting all U.S. airstrikes in Somalia because the monitoring group Air Wars said that there were suspected U.S. airstrikes in Somalia on June 11th and June 16th. Those could be CIA airstrikes. Um, but it's not, it's not clear. Um, but they say, you know, they have different ways that they rate reportings of airstrikes, you know, different like confidence levels. And these ones, they seem pretty sure that they were, that it was the U S they're just lacking confirmation from the U S military. So the U S escalated airstrikes in Somalia after Biden ordered the deployment of up to 500 troops to the country in May, 2022. And the big point I always have to make about Al Shabaab is that, you know, in these AFRICOM press releases, they say, Al-Shabaab is this huge, you know, Al-Qaeda group. They're a huge threat, global threat, but it's widely believed that the group does not have ambitions outside of Somalia. I linked to an article from War on the Rocks there, which has a lot of pretty mainstream, you know, analysts, and they actually have a few articles saying that, and that's what most experts and most people that know about Somalia agree. They don't have, you know, they're not a global threat. And the group's first recorded attack was in 2007 against Ethiopian troops who were occupying Mogadishu. And it wasn't until 2012 that al-Shabaab declared loyalty to al-Qaeda. And that was after years of fighting the U.S. and its proxies, which includes Ethiopia, because the U.S. backed the Ethiopian invasion of Somalia in 2006, 
which ousted the Islamic Courts Union. It was a coalition of Muslim leaders that were, uh, you know, in charge in Mogadishu. And Al-Shabaab, you know, was like the extremist offshoot of them. All right. Uh, the next one here, North Korea issues a nuclear warning to the United States. So North Korea on Thursday issued a warning over the U.S. deployment of a nuclear armed submarine to South Korea, saying that the provocation could potentially justify Pyongyang using its nuclear weapons. The Ohio-class USS Kennedy docked in the South Korean port of Busan on Tuesday, marking the first time since 1981 that an American nuclear armed submarine arrived in the country. So the provocation coincided with the first meeting of the Nuclear Con Consultative Group, the NCG, which was established by the U.S. and South Korea to increase cooperation related to U.S. nuclear weapons. So North Korean Defense Minister Kang Soon -nan Nam slammed the U.S. and South Korean cooperation on nuclear weapons in a press statement released by North Korea's Korean Central News Agency. So Kong said that the U.S. and South Korean officials that held uh, held this meeting to discuss the plan for using nukes against North Korea. That's how they view it. And he said, quote, I remind the U.S. military of the fact that the ever-increasing visibility of the deployment of the strategic nuclear submarine and other strategic assets may fall under the conditions of the use of nuclear weapons specified in the DPRK law on the nuclear force policy, end quote. He said that North Korea's nuclear doctrine, quote, allows the execution of necessary action procedures in case a nuclear attack is launched against it or it is judged that the use of nuclear weapons against it is imminent, end quote. So after U.S. officials held this, their meeting uh, with the South Korean counterparts, they released a statement that said any nuclear attack from the North will result in the end of that regime. South Korean President Yoon suk Yeol on Wednesday, he boarded the nuclear-armed submarine, the USS Kentucky, and he repeated the end of the regime's threat. So you have the South Korean president on this submarine, you know, threatening the North, um, and now they're saying, you know, threatening that you know you're getting close you know you're getting close to that red line so it's just such a dangerous you know just such an unnecessary situation for the u.s to be doing this and it just seems like it gets so little attention nobody seems to care or be aware of anything um so the u.s nuclear deployment in south korea provoked more north korean missile tests as the two sides continue tit for tat escalation and, you know, the Biden administration says that they want the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, but uh, I think sending nukes there uh, does not achieve that goal. All right, the next one here, Lockheed Martin predicts strong profits. This article is from Kyle Anzalone over at the Libertarian Institute. So Lock Lockheed Martin believes global instability is driving demand and sees an increase in annual profits. Washington's proxy war in Ukraine has caused an increase in arms spending among NATO members, boosting weapons makers' stock prices. On Tuesday, Lockheed raised its annual profit and sales outlook on strong demand for military equipment after making the announcement the company's stock price increased by 1%. So the billions in profit are driven by sales of big ticket items like the F-35. So Lockheed expects a full year net sales to be between $66.25 billion and $66.75 billion, up from its earlier forecast of $65 billion to $66 billion. Just huge numbers. Um, Kyle mentions that they've been struggling to produce the F-35s that can perform their pr promised abilities. They're always having troubles uh, with them. And they've additionally experienced a boost in demand for smaller items like the Javelin anti-tank missile that's made by Lockheed Martin and Raytheon, the former employer of Lloyd Austin. The White House has shipped thousands of Javelin systems to Kiev since President Biden took office. Um, so down here, Kyle says, uh, prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Lockheed's stock price traded below $340 a share. The price increased to over $450 within a few months. And on Thursday, Lockheed's stock was valued at $456 per share. So that could be kind of an evergreen story, you know, Lockheed <laughs> expecting strong profits. Uh, all right, the last one here is another one from the Libertarian Institute from Connor Freeman. 
Biden concerned over Netanyahu's judicial overhaul. So President Biden has been saying, you know, they're upset by Netanyahu's plans to overhaul the judiciary. And that's caused all these protests inside Israel. Um, and now Biden is saying it might threaten the special relationship. So President Joe Biden has admonished Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to cease his attempts to ram through his coalition's controversial judicial overhaul amid mass opposition protests. He recommends instead that the Israeli leader seek a broad consensus. Following a meeting with Israeli President Isaac Herzog, Biden told New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman that if a more democratic path is not taken, Washington's special relationship with Tel Aviv could be affected. So while still facing a corruption trial since coming to power last December, Netanyahu's coalition, made up of Likud, far-right, and ultra-Orthodox parties, has attempted to give the Knesset the power to override the Israeli Supreme Court decisions with a simple majority vote. The plan also calls for de facto control regarding court nominees. I believe Netanyahu has said that he might be willing to get rid of the uh, o- you know, overriding the, the Knesset simple majority overriding the Supreme Court decisions. Uh, For months, much of the citizenry has joined large and disruptive mass protests, so they're obviously not happy about it. Biden expressed to Friedman his support for the protests, saying that it shows the vibrancy of Israel's democracy, which must remain the core of our bilateral relationship. He continued explaining, quote, finding consensus, consensus on controversial areas of policy means taking the time you need for significant changes that's essential. So my recommendation to Israeli leaders is not to rush. I believe the best outcome is to continue to seek the broadest possible consensus here, end quote. Um, so Kyle mentions all the bad things about Israel. <laughs> um, and, you know, his point here is that uh, the U.S. doesn't care about the raid in Janine. The U.S. doesn't care that Israel has killed nearly 200 Palestinians. Um, you know, it's this judicial overhaul is really the only thing that is upsetting Biden. And uh, is the special relationship really threatened? I don't think so. Biden hasn't said anything about them killing a Palestinian American journalist. And if you look at, you know, the 2024 um, candidates right now, they're all trying to out Zionist each other. uh, And they're all, you know, mad at Biden for saying these things. And so I don't think the special relationship is really under any threat. And when they say special relationship, it makes me think the $3.8 billion in military aid that the U.S. gives Israel each year, enabling them to do what they do in Gaza and the West Bank. All right, that's it for the news for today. Go check out our viewpoints, how Africa surprised the West during the war in Ukraine. It's from Ted Snyder. One from Thomas Knapp, opposing war, no disclaimers required. One from Ramsey Baroud is Netanyahu pushing for Palestinian civil conflict. And that's, you know, one thing I think why we've seen this increase in operations against Palestinians is because, you know, a a war, you know, could definitely unite um, the Israelis. Uh, One from Doug Bandow, America requires a real foreign policy debate that's over at the American Conservative. And our spotlight is from Brandon P. Buck at the Libertarian Institute, Enemies Above, the FBI, and the Creation of the Brown Scare Myth. Uh, That is everything for me for today. That's it for the week. You could always help us out at antiwar.com slash donate. Uh, Also, please share the show, like and subscribe on YouTube, Odyssey, or Rumble, wherever you watch. If you listen to the audio version like most of you do, you can leave a review you could also tell your friends about the show. Uh, Follow us on Twitter, at the Camp Day for me, at Antiwarcom. But yeah, uh, I appreciate everything, all the feedback, all the listeners. I'll be back after the weekend with some more news for you. Thanks for listening.